I saw, you know, some amazing things. I went to Shenzhen, which is known as the Silicon Valley part of China. And this is a city that in 1979 was only 30,000 people, so a true fishing village. It's now 12 million people today, and there's talk that it could actually be 20 million people. I ended up seeing uh, the KKR of China, which is a uh, company that has developed these massive technology, you know, office parks, and they provide venture capital to companies, and they fund companies, and then they end up giving subsidized rents to these companies, and then they provide potentially free housing for their employees, and they have a shopping mall and green space. Those companies, 300 companies, can are creating $2 billion in sales. So over 40 years, they've gone from 30,000 to 12 million. I was there in the middle of that. In 1999, uh, I went with Mark Mobius when I worked for Templeton, and we visited Shenzhen. And I remember this is a brand new city. Everything about it is new. There's there's no newer city on the planet, was my, was my thinking at the time. And you said they've just grown from there. Yes, and when people have talked about ghost cities and the largesse through, you know, debt, you know, in China that, you know, frankly, I've been nervous about. I wonder if a lot of those ghost cities weren't essentially started from some of these, you know, office parks like this, but essentially it's not just building apartments, it's built with a plan, you know, where we're going to have companies and we're going to have R&D and we're going to, you know, pick the smartest companies and, you know, that it's a way to build out and to move these 300 million people from rural to urban that, that John just talked about. And so it's frankly and there's another, brilliant. There's another 300 million out there that are trying to figure out how to get in. They want into the cities. Well, they're going to be moving to other cities besides Beijing or Shanghai or Shenzhen. And the ghost cities that we were talking about five, ten years ago, those up. cities are filling up. They're filling up. I mean, the, the reality is China is doing something that no culture in the history of the world has ever done. Now, we moved 100 million people from Europe, essentially, to the U.S., or however many it was that came over and then grew up. They moved 250 million people in 30 years, 300 plus now million. That's a migration on a, on a scale that humanity's never seen. Uh, They're not just moving people. They're training and raising up scientists and technologists. I mean, you, you've got oh, another chart, I, the I, countries I, with the most STEM graduates. Tell us about that. It's like 10 times what we're doing in the U.S. And I remember 10 years ago, you'd read about that because they had that same advantage back then. And people in the U.S. would go, yeah, but that's with second and third tier universities. It's not from real universities like those in the U.S. Well, today you look at it, and they're putting out as many patents or more than we are. Those second and third tier universities that we were poo-pooing, turns out those graduates are cranking out patents, papers, Scientific new research. papers. You've got a chart Sci in there that shows China is dominating. 25% of all scientific papers are coming from China. It, it is, you've got to admire what they've done. I mean, it happened in a top-down economy. It happened in a culture that, you know, philosophically, politically, uh, we're probably not comfortable with. But you've still got to go, wow, they did it. And the second thing that I think we have to realize is they, they aren't stopping. Now, that doesn't disqualify the fact that they're still not playing fair on uh, letting U.S. countries in. They're still not playing fair on the culture barriers. Uh, they're still not, they have a desire to be geopolitically dominant, especially within the Asian sphere. Um, they're pushing back on the U.S. All of those geopolitical concerns are real. Well, let's talk about that, David, because you and I have shared a uh, 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 reading and passion for a book titled Unrestricted Warfare. It's written by two senior colonels of the People's Liberation Army. Tell me, what was your perspective as an investment man 
who, who read this, who's recently been to China, what do you think they're thinking? So I'm a little bit concerned, Kevin, about, you know, China has been, you know, a very, very strong culture for, you know, society for 4,000 years, and they've been down for the last 150, and they are now, you know, getting their mojo back. They've gotten it back, and they're now the second, you know, biggest economy in the world.